afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started to keep us on schedule. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Great. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to take um, about an hour and a half to talk about my favorite topic, electricity transmission. And we have four, well, maybe four and a half speakers total um, to share the results in, of their ongoing projects, uh, many of which, I think, I think all of which, maybe not one of them, I'm trying to remember, um, were uh, things that I initially looked at um, when I was at the consortium. So with that, Vahan, why don't you come on up? We're going to try to keep everyone um, on schedule so that we have plenty of time for questions excuse me, time for questions and interaction. And I think you all know to use the Slido app to submit any questions. Um, I'm not sure, Corey, what has been the practice earlier today? Did people ask questions after each, or did we wait for everyone to finish? Okay, we'll wait to the end. Okay, Vaughn, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thank you. This is all right. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my name is Vahan Gevorgan. I'm a chief, chief engineer for grid integration at NRL. And today I'll be sharing with you the progress on, on a project that uh, NRL and EPRI are conducting. And the title of a project listed here, essentially development of advanced methods for evaluating grid stability impacts of both AC and DC uh, interconnected offshore wind power plants. <coughs> So this project has been going on almost for a year and a half now, and we have another uh, six months or so to go. So we are closer to the uh, uh, closing stage of a project. Um, the, dur during this last period, we'll be focused on this uh, couple of tasks highlighted here in a, in a red box. Basically, um, uh, stability assessment of uh, uh, interconnection of a large share of uh, uh, offshore wind power plants uh, with, with free ISOs in the U.S. and also uh, exploring using the platform we develop uh, how the controls by wind power plant themselves can help mitigating uh, some of the stability problems that may present themselves. So uh, the, uh, the stability problems that uh, can exist in, uh, in this context is, is, is essentially the same as for any any type of the power system with the high share of variable renewables. Uh, the difference for offshore integration is that, that you know, high levels of uh, uh, variable power are being injected straight into a major load centers at the points of interconnections that originally have not been designed to handle uh, that, that much power. So uh, the development of our platform, our tool, is focused on uh, developing a capability to help the industry to evaluate stability impacts in as early stages of a project as possible, hopefully during the planning stage, and also for a tool to uh, pr uh, find a mitigating solution if such of these problems present themselves, for example, after the major changes in a grid or, or things like that. Uh, so the project team is the uh, uh, is NRL. It, it, it's under funding by NYSERDA and Maryland Energy Administration. Uh, NRL is a prime institution. Um, EPRI uh, team is EPRI, EPRI is a team member. Um, we have also advisory team, including the folks from Orsted and Equinor. Um, ISO advisors include relevant folks from New York ISO, ISO New England, and PJM. We also have industry advisory board from uh, other major companies or, or, or uh, players in the area, such as Ocean Wind, Shell, and ENBW uh, uh, North America. So what is our approach? Our approach is essentially uh, to develop and utilize the hybrid simulation tool uh, that uses uh, advantages of the existing uh, commercial software tools uh, by uh, bringing them together in, in, in one uh, uh, simulation platform. Uh, so what is the advantage of doing it? Um, the, the power system is very large. And if you want to do simulations and uh, evaluate uh, stability impacts on a transient scale, it's really hard to do it for a large power system. Well, it's technically possible, but the computational challenges are, are enormous. On the other hand, the uh, positive sequence phasor models have been used uh, to do that uh, for dynamic simulations on a whole interconnection level. And that's an established tool, and that's what utilities are using. 
many valid models are there, but it has its own limitations, of course. So the idea was to combine the best of both worlds, both, both phasor domain or positive sequence simulation and, and the transient domain in one tool, automate it in such a way that can be used to streamline uh, the analysis and simulation um, of, the, of the system that have uh, high shares of the uh, offshore power injecting into the grid. In addition to that, uh, the, the system is interfaced uh, not only by exchanging the uh, voltage and current data, essentially waveforms, but also the ability to conduct stability analysis using the NRL developed uh, impedance scan tool that can be inserted in a model that is also developed in a PSCAT. So uh, it, it essentially allows us to do small signal stability-like analysis and identify what type of stability impacts, control interactions, uh, Subsynchronous or supersynchronous oscillations or, or resonances are uh, maybe 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 present in the system. So it's it, it's not hard to guess that it took us a lot of time to automate this process, make it work reliably and flawlessly, understand all the uh, nuts and bolts of such an interfacing. For example, you really want to have such interface uh, designed and deployed in such a way that you don't have artificial stability. Uh, phenomena being presented by, by the fact that uh, your the boundary point between two simulation domains is not, is not chosen correctly for a particular simulation scenario. So we've done a lot of testing in a smaller test systems in PSSE only, in PSCAD only, and then this co in co-simulation platform make sure that results are identical and cross-validated. So after, after, after doing that, we moved into a larger simulation domain. So NRL was in charge of developing of the uh, transient simulation tools and models and this impedance scan tool and every team was in charge of uh, uh, conditioning the PSSE model of this ISOs and, and uh, um, in, in, in integrate uh, the offshore wind power plants in them so then can be later substituted by the uh, uh, PSCAT simulation. EPRI also did the uh, model development for the HVDC links that we also use uh, to, uh, uh, for simulation with HVDC interconnected wind power plants. So um, when you, again, when you bring this much of a, a variable generation into the load centers, um, the, one of the main challenge you have is essentially grid strength. If, if the point of interconnection is relatively weak, that is essentially a recipe of all kinds of instability problems. So it was only natural for us to do a scanning of the uh, short circuit ratios of all plant uh, offshore wind power plants, identify the weakest points, and then do our sim, uh, uh, evaluate the applicability of our tools specifically for those weak points. And, uh, and we found some interesting results there. This, this chart here shows an kind of evaluated short circuit ratio for a number of the MMWG projects, and as you can see, some of them have relatively uh, very uh, low short circuit ratio in order between two and three. Um, so when we do this type of evalu evaluations, we also de uh, uh, develop the models of the offshore wind power plants, AC and DC connected in a PSCAT. And uh, again, this is not the integration study, this is the uh, tools development. So we had to use the generic models of everything because we don't have access to project specific models. So we had to make some technology assumptions for both AC and DC options. So basically, main assumptions are listed here, nothing special. So we're looking at a 10 megawatt or larger wind turbines uh, with the 66 kilovolt collector system uh, voltages, uh, uh, with the 230 kilovolt uh, export cable with shunt compensation and everything for AC option, and 320 volt kilovolt DC uh, uh, HVDC option. All connections we are looking at this in this particular stage of a project are radial point-to-point -point connections. Uh, we are not looking at a multi-terminal um, HVDC solution yet. Um, so this is one example of how complex the model can be in a PSCAD. So uh, there is a, a model of the, uh, the transient model of the uh, multi-turbine uh, HVAC interconnected wind plant. So each turbine model I mean, if you go in there, it's a detailed model of a turbine that can be 
used either in a switching mode or in, a, in an average mode. So this is the most complicated case if you want to understand what's happening and what type of interactions are present within a wind power plant itself. When we are looking at the interactions between plant and the rest of a grid, we of course simplify it for, a, for the sake of computational speed and equivalence in having a, a fewer number, lesser number, uh, lesser number of wind turbines. Model can be easily adapted for any size of a wind turbine, any voltage, uh, uh, level in the, in the array and any configuration of these radial lines and the, uh, uh, and the substations. And the similar flexibility we have also for HVDC option, which I'll talk about in a minute. So how we streamline this process, this is an example of 800 megawatt Goanos point of interconnection, uh, the 40 offshore wind power plant in, in New York ISO. So we take, going from top to down, we take the original model of a system in the PSSC, we break it down to the uh, interface point between PSSC and PSCAD. These black boxes here are just uh, concealing the bus numbers, which we don't show for sensitivity reasons. And then later on, we have a PSCAD model up to the point of interconnection in a substation inland. And the yellow box in there, you see it uh, actually our uh, uh, impedance scan tool that we can insert in there to scan the impedance on both sides and understand uh, small signal stability problems that may exist in a system like this. So let's start with that. Uh, the, um, when you, uh, so impedance stability or assess, uh, impedance based stability tool can be a very powerful tool, of course, if you use it right. And there are many tricks and other things that, that we have to solve, of course. The original work for this was done by RPI, Professor San, and he's a uh, uh, world expert and the pioneer in this area, and so a lot of his work is in, uh, uh, inspired by him. Uh, but basically, um, do, do, uh, evaluating the impedance uh, uh, of both plant and net network is not, is not that simple. It's not just simply you know, injecting the voltage disturbance and me measuring the current response. There are other phenomena, for example, such as frequency coupling, in a perfectly uh, balanced system, the frequency coupling shouldn't be present, but in reality, uh, there are PLLs in a the system, there are weak uh, DC buses in, uh, in the turbines uh, themselves. Um, there, uh, there, there, there are other things, uh, asymmetric uh, controls uh, of, uh, of current regulators. That, that may cause all type of a frequency coupling, which result in a so-called frequency uh, mirroring effect, which means you can have uh, resonances in not just during one frequency, or, but on some other frequencies as well. So uh, we do that by, by measuring the plant admittance and net network admi admi admittance, and then comparing them. So this is a gen just a general, uh, general diagram, but how exactly we do it, I explain on a, uh, simple uh, sequence impedance analysis result, which, which doesn't include uh, coupling for a simplicity. So you have the uh, both amplitude and phase response uh, of both a wind power plant and, uh, and, and the rest of a grid uh, as shown on this graph. So where the uh, magnitude, uh, uh, where the magnitudes cross each other, that's where the resonance is possible, but it also depends on the phase difference between them. So in this case, the phase margin is good enough. We're talking about the yellow dots, phase margin about 25 degrees, so we are relatively safe. But if there is some additional inductance introduced in this system, and we're not talking about uh, too much inductance, the whole thing may shift to the right, um, the resonance may happen at a new point, these blue points, and then the phase margin is big enough to start causing uh, undamped oscillations. So just 7.5 uh, millihenry of inductance added somewhere in a system, this can be transformers, this can be extra transmission line, this can be something else at the substation, may push this system into a total instability uh, mode. So uh, this basically shows how we, we can use the uh, impedance scan tool that we developed to identify this problem in uh, as early stages uh, as possible. Uh, well, the, the tool also allow, allows, as I said, to do a, a, a lot of si I mean, simulations in a, in a, in a time, time domain. Uh, this is an example of uh, a free phase fault happening in onshore grid, and that, that uh, this is a result of the, uh, uh, the plant going uh, riding through that fault. In this case, we are using the generic model of the wind power plant, and, and as you can see, the right through is not that, is not that smooth. Uh, it, there is a pretty uh, heavy transient behavior that may cause the whole plant to trip off. That basically 
uh, under, uh, underlines the importance of having the, uh, the valid model from a vendor uh, to perform this type of analysis. And, and the beauty of this approach is that you don't even need to have an open box model. It can be a black box model. You don't even need to know what's going on to use it in a, in a, in a simulation or evaluation tool we developed. Uh, so the grid strength has a, a big impact. As I mentioned, this is another example of the PGM Indian River point of interconnection. The uh, uh, short circuit ratio of point of interconnection was pretty low to begin with. If there is a line trip off on an onshore network, that grid strength actually goes even down, compromising the stability of a system. And exactly that's what we observe in a co-simulation. Um, when uh, you trip some offshore wind line, the wind plant rides through it, but then after that, the, uh, it triggers uh, some undamped mode in the system, and you see that the system just stop, starts oscillating. So the how, how to mitigate it, the only way or the only controls you have is mainly on a wind power plant side, and, and, and you see it on the right where we immediately commanded the wind plant to curtail to a certain degree, and also in this case we're using the uh, frequency and voltage droops for additional damping, and, and you can see that the plant right through from exact same contingency scenarios without uh, uh, going into instability. A um, um, lot of work we've done already for HVDC interconnected wind plants. As I mentioned, the model of MMC HVDC was developed by EPRI team and given to us, and for every wind power plant that, uh, uh, that we're using in this analysis that has HVDC interconnection, we are simulating and evaluating the platform for that particular case. Uh, this is an example of the uh, HVDC interconnected wind, pl wind plant uh, going through a fault. In a, in a left case, the fault happens in an in a onshore grid. This is for Farragut in, a, in, in, in New York. Uh, you can see that even if fault happens in a grid, the beauty of HVDC is that it provides sufficient isolation between grid and the wind power plant. So wind power plant doesn't even see that fault uh, in, on its voltages uh, he, here on the bottom. And that's because uh, of the uh, DC chopper and uh, good HVDC controls in a, in, in a plant. Of course, this is only for certain durations of a fault. If a fault is indefinite or long enough, eventually the, everything will collapse. And then we also done a cases when the faults are happening in an onshore network, I'm sorry, in an offshore network and showing uh, how it impacts uh, 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 the uh, voltage and current at the point of interconnection. Um, the, the grid strength has a big impact for HVDC interconnected plants as well. The, they are voltage source converters. However, um, they can't operate with a very, very weak grids until you take special measures. This is an one example analysis we did uh, for that generic HVDC model, exposing it to a uh, weaker and weaker short circuit ratio by slowly reducing it in a PS cap, basically, and showing that at a certain point, the system, the HVDC plant itself, or I, I'm sorry, HVDC terminal itself on the a, on a, on a onshore side goes into instability mode. In this particular case, it's about 40 hertz and damp oscillations. So that's also very important to keep in mind because uh, uh, without special controls or adding special equipment, for example, in the form of synchronous condensers, this type of situation may be unavoidable. So in a short summary, basically, we developed this simulation platform already. Uh, we built some confidence in its stability and the way it works. It's automated enough to streamline and do a process really fast. So now we're uh, essentially studying the case after case, trying to demonstrate uh, its use. Again, this is not an integration study. We're just using the data we have from the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, projects that are in development um, uh, to, to, to uh, generate a result showing the industry what to expect and how to use this, this, this tool. Uh, and, the, and the last thought, so what is next? I'll, assuming we finish this, what is going to happen next? And I think we think the best, best uh, approach or next step in the future would be develop a, developing a tool that allows uh, essentially cloud-based tool. So people can plug in uh, their models of the offshore project, whether developers or vendors, um, uh, uh, into this cloud-based tool and, 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 and basically do what we are doing without having this uh, you know, complicated uh, system in one model where uh, you know, one modeler has to take care of everything. Let's assume you have 
already a valid model in a positive sequence of a whole Eastern interconnection. Vendors can bring in their, uh, their models for the existing projects, plug it in, and study them this well, and they'll be firewalled, and they won't be exposed to each other, no IT issues, no model sensitivity issues, and so forth. So we think this may be a future, and if this is nothing uh, special at this point, well, well, not special enough, because someone else is doing it already. Uh, AMO in, in Southern Australia already deployed system like this, and, and that system is pioneering uh, in the world in terms of the, uh, uh, how much renewables they are integrating. So we think that that might be a good solution for the uh, offshore context as well. So sorry if I went ahead of over time. I think I'm done. So, yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Link. I'm the program director of the Seabed Systems Group here at Thayer Mahan. Um, halfway through this presentation, I'm actually going to shift over to my colleague, Nico Sabrina, over here to discuss uh, part of the project that he's been working on. Um, a little bit different in the scope, the initial scope, uh, but it constantly came up with some of our advisory board meetings and talking to folks within the industry, so I thought it was important to, to touch on um, at this conference. But we're going to be talking about transmission export cable fault detection and prevention using synthetic aperture sonar. So a little bit of different of an approach when you start to evaluate the health of the inner array and the transmission cables of a, of a wind farm over here. Um, this is a long presentation. I'm going to keep it down to 15 minutes here. But um, I'll introduce kind of who was involved in the project itself. I'll talk about the technical overview of the system we were actually employing. Um, look at the little bit of the, of the experiment and show some of the results and the data analysis behind it. Um, and then conclude with uh, next steps and, and what, we, uh, what we discovered from the, from the experimentation here. Uh, so first of all, the primary project partners, Ocean IQ, Global Marine, uh, experts in uh, subsea cables. Uh, they're absolutely instrumental in this project. Certainly learned a lot from, from working with them uh, and really appreciate uh, all their effort and expertise throughout the project. Um, Thera Mahan, and I'll discuss our company here in a second. And then the uh, State University of New York, uh, primarily uh, Dr. Paul Kump, who is a, a major component of this, uh, of this effort here. So who are we? Um, small Connecticut, Groton, Connecticut, actually, uh, based firm, primarily focused on defense operations. And if that's shocking to you, anyone who's got a hist or naval history background will understand by our namesake, um, we used to focus mostly um, in the defense world. But a lot of the technology itself that we operate from the passive acoustic monitoring to the active collection work um, directly translates to commercial energy kind of maritime operations. And so being close to New London, Connecticut, kind of the epicenter of the offshore wind industry over here, um, we are starting to look at different technology suites and offerings that we have and that we provide and how those translate into, uh, into offshore wind. Um, and primarily one of the tools that we work with is a uh, synthetic aperture sonar. And I'll talk about that later. So the goal for this product itself, develop, test, and validate sensors, procedures, and data analysis methodologies to identify sections of subsea cables vulnerable to and currently experiencing potential failure events. So the main thesis over here is if you have routine survey work, for example, you can ultimately reduce the LCOE based on having a preventative maintenance approach rather than responding to catastrophic events. So if we can identify where there's going to be problems with the cable, whether it's going to be um, in the material construction, for example, in exposed sections, um, whether it's going to be impacted by the environment, say with seabed movement um, or cable movement, or if it's going to be uh, man-made interference, for example, fishing gear uh, in the vicinity of the cable. If we can look at those four major failure modes, then we can start to think which cables are more susceptible to potential failure events and kind of nip it in the bud rather than having to respond to a catastrophic failure. We can do it in a cost-effective measure. Um, and these four critical failure mold modes were identified by working with our folks at uh, Global Marine, who they maintain an extensive database of cable failures uh, throughout the world, and not just transmission cable, but data cables as well. And of all of the events, and they've been doing this for over 100 years now, these were the four most common areas where they said, okay, if you see this, this is going to be indicative of a, of a potential failure bet in the future. System that we used was a Sea Scout. It's a Kraken Robotics MinSAS 180. And I'll discuss that actually in the next slide over here a little bit better, um, which is a synthetic aperture sonar. Um, and what does that mean? So a lot of folks in this room are, are probably familiar with it, but you can think of a, <clears throat> of a real aperture sonar 
but or a regular side scan, you can think of an edge checker or a client system, but instead of relying on the actual length of the physical array, you are generating that synthetically in the software, hence a synthetic aperture sonar. And the reason why this is important is you can start to have range independent resolution. And that means whether the item of interest is 10 meters away or 100 meters away, it's going to look exactly the same in space. And that's important when you're trying to look at infrastructure or the greater area around it, for example, evidence of fishing gear or drag marks or things like that, that you're working with the same data set. You have the same fidelity. And the way it does this is you can think of the resolution as being a function of the array length or the frequency. So if I have a really high frequency itself, I can have very fine resolution, but my effective range is going to be diminished. Or I can have a very long array, but then there's operational manufacturing and maintenance concerns that are involved with it. So if you can synthetically generate this array, and the center frequency is 337 kilohertz, you can effectively have three centimeter by three centimeter resolution out to several hundred meters on either side, single side swath. In this case, 200 meters on either side based on the 10 degree depression angle and the real aperture sonar length. And that allows us to go about eight knots area coverage right around three, nautical, three square nautical miles. And I'll touch on that a little bit later um, in a perfect scenario. And again, it's all about being cost effective in this case. So while the technology itself may be a little bit higher end and more expensive, the area you can cover is much greater. And so that's reduced costs on target, as I would say. So that's reduced ship costs, that's reduced operational costs, it's reduced crew costs. So the integrated system workflow we had, we had this uh, miniature interferometric synthetic aperture sonar, but we also had an RT Sonic on board as well. And then we had a towed multi-beam that was in the form factor. So talking with our project partners, we looked at all the different ways that people can look at different survey work for preventative maintenance. Um, ideally, next time I'd like to have a real aperture sonar, a towed side scan with it, but we didn't want to do dual towed um, operations during this project. So we have data from a surface mounted multi-beam, a towed multi-beam, which is pretty unique, and then the synthetic aperture sonar, which is the highlight of, of this project itself. So the survey locations, and as I mentioned, the four failure modes. So one of them was exposed cables. Um, ideally, we don't see those in a live setting. So we had to do an experimental setup or a controlled experiment for that. And I'll touch on the different um, targets, as I call them, that we use in a seated environment. And we did that outside of Long Island Sound, image to the left. And then we were fortunate enough to get permission from Orsted to look at the Block Island Wind Farm, for example, to look at using the technology itself in a live operational setting to see what we could derive from it, whether the mattressing was installed correctly, whether there's evidence of fishing gear, drag marks in the region, exposed cable, all things of that, but in a live setting. So two experiments, basically. One is going to be more controlled, and one is not even an experiment, but collection on a live environment. This is just the, uh, the route planning for the different targets that we laid here. Um, and they were laid in a line, make it very easy, easy for us. A, alpha through echo, A, B, C, D, E. And each one had a different level of damage that was imparted to it. So we could start to characterize whether or not the sonar itself could, could <clears throat> one, identify the small cable because limited exposed sections, and two, characterize the level of damage that, that was occurring. And this was all done, again, by us, so um, on the vessel itself. So here's what an undamaged piece looks like. Um, Global Marine was fortunate enough to provide us different sections of cable, um, several meters. Again, if I were to do this, I would like to have longer stretches of it. Um, but this cable itself is very heavy and very difficult to deploy. Um, and what we did is we imparted different levels of damage onto all of them. So this is what a non-damaged cable would look like, simulated target A, and then below it you can see in the sonar imagery. Um, and then you can also notice the line coming off of it, which is part of the buoy, and Nico will talk on that later. So for Bravo, min minimal damage to the sheath, the outer cable, but you can definitely see the intensity returns changing on that. Charlie here is a more catastrophic failure where it starts to unravel and you have more of the core, not the core, but the innards of the cable showing. And again, you can see the sonar data response for that. D is a very catastrophic failure and you can actually look to the left and see the shadow um, of the intensity of the uh, actual sonar itself from the sheath and the, uh, the strands up in the water column itself. And echo was something very unique. Um, is actually bending in the cable. So these are large, large cables. Anyone who's worked with them or been around them, uh, very surprising to me that this could happen. Uh, but talking to Global Marine and seeing uh, actually videos, ROV footage of it, um, this is a, a failure event, but much more difficult to see in the sonar itself. So going from <clears throat> alpha to echo with greater damage and the final one being um, when it's actually knotted itself. Uh, here's a good kind of summary of that. You can look at the actual SAS derived imagery, I can call it the intensity returns. You can look at the cable itself, the image from the vessel, and then the footage blows from an ROV, but not from this particular project. These are just representative of the different failures that you could see on subsea cables, just so everyone's in the same frame of reference over here. 
Um, and then here's the overview of what it looks like in a, in a mosaic and a single path of travel. Um, so the nice thing about the sensor itself is we can put the item of interest right in about the, the center of the swath on the single side, and then you can start to look at other items of interest in the area. For example, ghost fishing gear that was just a coincidence that it was left there, but again, evidence of fishing gear in the region. You can see the anchors on the sides, and I'll show later you can also see evidence of the drag marks and the targets were removed because it's not always the presence of objects that could interfere with the cable or evidence that people had been near the area, but also um, if they had been but had removed their gear, for example, that's indicative of future failure events. I'll skip over this. This is just going through the different, characterizing the different levels of damage that we did see over here. Um, and then to the live setting. So we did a controlled experiment, looked at the sonar itself. Okay, um, is our positioning, is our setup correct? Are we getting the right data? Can we actually identify the cable itself, these small sections? Um, and now can we translate that to a live setting to see if we can apply the lessons learned and evaluate the efficacy of the system itself? So this is the Block Island uh, wind farm. Um, you notice gaps in the mosaic here that we, that we have. Um, closer to the wind farm, there was construction activity in the same to shore, so we opted to not survey those areas. So you have two large sections, one by the wind turbines themselves and one going closer to, uh, to Point Judith. Um, and again, you can see the, the turbines, uh, the foundations one through five on the side over here and the actual mosaic itself from the, from the collection. Um, area coverage, this was lower than uh, what's, what's typically collected with the system itself because this was less about efficiency and more about overlapping passes to collect the highest volume of data on known items of interest. In this case, it was the foundation base because we were very curious about current flow and sand waves in the area, and I've got some zoomed in images that will show that. That could be indicative of having uh, an impact on the infrastructure itself, especially when you can't reach the target depth of burial. Um, here's a cable corridor itself, uh, this cable crossings, these are chartered over here. Um, in these depths, right, the cable needs to be buried, um, but in certain cases you're just not going to get that, and whether it's a geological issue, whether it's an existing infrastructure in the region, and so you are going to have these crossings and these mattressings that go over them. And those of you who aren't familiar, I do have some zoomed in photos. The mattressing itself looks like several um, like concrete blocks basically that are woven together, and they're placed over the cable itself, and the sole purpose is to prevent cable movement, cable damage, abrasion, um, whether it's going to be uh, like a, a large weather event or just, I guess, general wear and tear, but also fishing gear and anchor movement. Um, while we were doing this project, there was an event in Port Wainini where a uh, oil pipeline was moved by an anchor, commercial anchor, created a big, a big issue. And then shortly before this project, there was an issue with uh, offshore wind cables in the North Sea, I believe, um, where it was abrasion from the mattressing and the matting itself. So having an understanding of how these are laid, their positioning, and then characterizing their movement over time uh, is critical when looking at potential failure events um, and the costs and preventing the costs that are associated with that type of uh, um, corrective activity. Again, the base is over here. You can see it coming in. You can see the different sand waves in Block Island specifically. <clears throat> and then zoomed in version of the actual getting the, uh, the ground um, starting to cover the mattressing. And then you can see evidence to the right of fishing gear and debris on the line itself, um, whether this was uh, from ghost fishing gear or just something falling off a vessel. You see a lot of tires and, and random things in the seafloor. But you can start to see in the bottom the different sand waves um, coming up over the mattressing itself, the cable structure, and then evidence of gear in the area. So it was interesting to collect data on a, uh, a, live, a live environment target, so to speak. Um, and initially this project was supposed to be two phase um, for a lot of reasons had to be condensed down into one, but we did have historical data um, from previous surveys of the area. So to look to see what's actually changed from say 2020, 21, and now 22 in terms of debris in the area, drag marks, whether the mattressing's in the exact same position or not, um, it was an interesting study. And so from a positioning standpoint, we always do this equipment verification test, and that's a big question that comes up with a towed system, for example. Um, when you look at different survey specs and requirements, uh, you know, very, very tight typically. Um, and it's hard when you're towing something where the, uh, the scope is, you know, five to one or the layback, excuse me, is further back from the vessel itself and these waters aren't very deep. So when you're operating this environment, it's very important to characterize um, your actual positional accuracy over here. And this is an example that we were doing on one of the, uh, the seated targets. So within a meter, which is standard for, um, for kind of towed uh, side scan sonar, and you can see the port and starboard uh, average themselves. So having this was important for us to actually be able to say, yes, your, your cable has moved or your mattressing has moved. And now the question that still is undetermined to me is, you know, is this fine enough to actually make a, a, a decision, especially from a maintenance standpoint? And we talk about um, pipeline infrastructure in the Gulf, for example, it will move several meters at a time during large weather events. Um, and cable itself is within a meter. Uh, is that substantial enough? Is that something worth discussing? And that requires further discussion with, with project partners. Um, the change detection piece that I did mention earlier, um, again, this project was meant to be a, a kind of a dual, uh, dual surveys, but 
uh, we're unable to accomplish that. So we have the single data, but then historical data that we're still looking at. But one of the important things here is actually evidence of activity in the region. So not just um, actual like lobster pots, for example, or trash in the region, but you can look at the picture to the right, but actual drag marks. So still evidence that um, there was activity. And for us, it's important to characterize uh, what the temporal resolution should be. Right, in certain areas, if you survey a day later, the grounds go completely different. Other areas, if it's rocky, you know, it might stay the same for, for several weeks or several months. So one, identifying how often these surveys need to occur to still be cost effective, and two, to start to be able to identify different uh, changes in the region. Um, and this was all done manually with an operator looking at you know one-to-one -one kind of um, comparisons. But uh, goals in the future are to actually be able to identify uh, certain items of interest and change detection specifically through automated techniques which is what uh, Nico's gonna be talking on here, uh, talking about here shortly. Um, different sensors that I mentioned before, surface mounted multi-beam, you're gonna suffer in resolution because of you know, how far the sensor is itself and the propagation of sound. The towed multi-beam, it's very interesting, it's only several meters above the seafloor. And then the SAS itself, um, you can see the image on the right. And you can derive the small changes in bathymetry through the SAS via interferometry because you do have um, vertically displaced arrays on each side, but you can also use the multi-beam itself when you start to look at um, seafloor environment actually piling up around critical infrastructure and being able to characterize, well, how tall is it and how much has that changed? Then you can start to look at difference maps where you may not need certain automated techniques to look at changes, but you can start doing like a one-to-one -one comparison if your positioning is, uh, is good enough. Um, current survey methodologies, um, this goes into future events, you know, ROVs, AUVs, divers, vessel mounted systems. Um, definitely want to have a, a good baseline in the future if we were to do this, it'd be nice to have a one-to-one -one with uh, you know, a towed side scan system, an ROV for example, and each other pluses and minuses and you can do a cost assessment, which we did in some of the, uh, the, the desktop studies that we did prior to executing the at sea event. Um, but it would be interesting for future uh, survey work to have kind of one-to-one -one comparisons from both the cost effective standpoint and data quality standpoint. And then, of course, there's limitations with this. Uh, you could talk to a lot of the folks in here and say, okay, well, this is an external method to look at cable failure events and you know, feedback from the Orsted team as well as, well, there's a lot of internal ways and, and ways we could do this with either persistent sensors or by looking at the data from the cable itself. And yes, absolutely valid. This is just one approach. And then this is also susceptible to motion in the system, right? When you look at in the future, potentially having AUVs, for example, you can reduce that motion because you're not coupled to a vessel itself, um, but then you're not gonna have that real-time feedback. Same thing with the uh, sound velocity issues. With the real-time feedback, you could dive below thermoclines, for example, um, if you are getting this, uh, this poor data, um, whereas an AUV, you'd have to wait for a survey to conclude. And then, as I mentioned, yeah, sorry, thermoclines over to the right here. So pluses and minuses with the different survey limitations. Um, with that, before I kind of get into concluding remarks, I want to turn over to Nico real quick here to talk about some of his ATR automated target recognition work that he did um, with the product itself, and then we'll close out. So. Hi, everyone. Uh, I know I don't have much time, so I'll keep it quick. Um, <laughs> yeah, <hi. clears throat> so uh, my name is Nico Severino. I am the machine learning uh, solutions engineer over at uh, Thayer Mahan, and I specialize with working um, on the collected data and trying to implement it into current, AT or, um, current automated solutions like machine learning, uh, neural networks, and such. So for this recent collect, um, uh, we took the data. There wasn't as much as we'd like for a neural network application. Usually for neural network applications, you need to have tens of thousands of samples, um, but we were working with about like 150 or so. Um, so given that sample size, um, I had taken the data and curated it into uh, several data sets um, with varying label classes. Uh, the ones that Steve had mentioned before, there's the five class A through E with varying degrees of damage. Um, but then we also have a four class set just concatenates the B and C classes together. Um, reason being is because they look uh, very similar, and we'll see some visualizations of that later on. Um, and the binary set, which just makes it a binary classification problem between uh, class A being undamaged and the uh, rest of the classes being damaged. So using um, an object detection approach, uh, which is uh, the main sort of computer vision uh, method out there right now, um, I used a model called YOLO v5, or you only look once is what it stands for. Um, that's the current commonly accepted object detection model out there. And uh, implementing this problem into an automated target recognition problem uh, can open up a bunch of different doors. Uh, for instance, instead of having these surveyed um, towed sensors going back and forth to make sure that the cables are doing all fine and well, um, you can just have an automated system, an automated AUV, which is called automated underwater vehicle. Um, that has this sort of brain that understands the targets that they're looking for and uh, can detect if there's any sort of damage. So um, 
With that being said, you can see the different sort of distributions of the sample sizes we had for the different uh, data sets. Um, the original training sets, um, well, well, I'll say each class or each set uh, is divvied up into three different classes, um, training, validation, and test. So you'll train your neural network on uh, however many samples you have. You can validate that during the training process with, let's say, 30 in this case, um, and then you test it on untouched data that's supposed to be your real world benchmark, um, and that's also 38. So um, originally, we were working with about 113 samples for training. Again, very, very low. Um, but uh, with some augmentation methods that were applied, which we'll go into in a little bit, we were able to double that number. Um, and yeah, you can see here how the, um, uh, the five class, every class has about 20 to 30 samples um, for training, but if you lower that number just by switching the labels, um, just by pretty much saying like, given this sample set, let's name it something else, maybe the computer can understand it a little bit better, you can increase the training size that it's able to work with. Um, so for the binary set, you have like almost 100 for the damage to learn off of, or actually 200 in the augmented sense, uh, and about 40 for the undamaged. Um, so augmentation here was achieved simply by mirroring the image on its y-axis. Um, this is to sort of replicate the port and starboard distinction you would see using the sensors that we have. Uh, imagine a sensor being towed along this, um, on the seafloor. Um, it has two different sort of eyes it looks out from, so like on the left and on the right. Uh, an x-axis augmentation would be technically unrealistic in this case because what we're trying to do here is create augmentations, synthetic data that would be, um, you know, actually there. Um, there's a lot of different augmentations and methods that could be applied such as uh, messing with the contrast, saturation, so on and so forth, um, rotations, a lot of different things, um, but then we'd be straying further and further away from the real data and um, these augmentations would be good to apply with more data in the future. Uh, to evaluate our models, we used a performance metric called the mean average precision score, uh, which is the commonly accepted um, sort of benchmark score used in object detection. Uh, you can calculate this score with three different variables. Um, one, of the, one of the variables being the intersection over union, IOU. Uh, pretty much you have the predicted label and then you have the ground truth label. And whatever that overlap is, you can set a threshold um, to sort of say that it's accurate or not. So in our case, we mainly worked with at least 50% of the predicted label has to be on the ground truth, and that's considered correct, but ideally you have 100%. Um, and then you have two um, variables, precision, recall, uh, just to kind of go through that. Precision is pretty much the, uh, all, of all samples that have been predicted, how many are true. Um, and recall is out of every sample possible, how many are true, how many are uh, false negatives. Um, it's just two different variables that should be at a one-to-one -one ratio uh, if you want to have a confident, accurate model. Um, so if you take the ratio of precision recall with the IOU, then you end up with your mean average precision score, which is how you evaluate your model. So given that evaluation, um, I had ran about 20 experiments uh, with the different data sets we had. So um, you have six different data sets, unaugmented, augmented, binary four and five, and um, I forgot to mention this, but I tested on three different versions of ELV5, comes in various sizes. Um, pretty much the larger model you, ha you have, the more training time it takes, the more sort of specific it is in its learning, but sometimes that uh, could be uh, harmful for your results. Um, so of the 20 or so uh, experiments that we ran, uh, the top three were the augmented binary, which would make sense. You're reducing how many variables there are, increasing the sort of variable training size um, so that the model can learn uh, much, uh, efficient, much more efficiently. And the next up was the augmented four, which was expected, um, and augmented five with the 0.588 mean average precision. So ideally, we have that augmented five score being quite high because we'd like to be able to detect the different um, varying degrees of damage. But um, with these experiments, you, you look at your data and then you sort of reevaluate how you should train your model um, based on the results you get. Um, and a really good way to see how the model is, is actually performing is by looking at the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix here has axes of a predicted label on the left, uh, that's the y-axis, the ground truth on the y, and then the uh, intensity return, the color intensity return is pretty much just how frequently that specific instance happens. So ideally what you want is a uh, dark diagonal line across the matrix, um, and that tells you that the model's predictions are lined up with the ground truths. 
100% of the time, hopefully. But in this case, there is some uh, variations and outliers, um, oftentimes confused with the background. So if you look at the confusion matrix and compare it to visual results, you can see what is actually happening and you can you know, adjust your data set if need be. As Steve mentioned before, the synthetic targets that we had in place were laid down using a tether. So um, classes A through E were all on one large line with two buoys on either end. So the model here on cable A was um, actually detecting the tether m most of the time, um, which kind of shows how the model is getting confused, but it's also working pretty well because it's, uh, uh, it's incorrectly labeling something that isn't cable A, but could be, could be confused as cable A as that. And another example would be cable E. Cable E was a very interesting case, whereas the the whole knot, um, but sometimes the sea floor has very interesting, distinct shapes to it that would confuse the model. Um, and all of these confusions could be avoided with more data. So um, another thing that I forgot to mention, but Steve brushed over, was that the cable D um, has a, a lot of fraying in the damage, um, and as a result, you see these, this really uh, high intensity return right here, but also a large shadow casted. So, in the annotations, or in, when we annotate the data, um, we want to include all that shadow data so that um, the model can maybe understand that, uh, whether it be for a different application where there's a large shadow. Shadow information is very important. Um, so that's the reason why the C class was appended to the B as opposed to the D. Um, but yeah, variations of the data like this um, will be less of a confusion for the model with greater amounts of data. So next steps would be um, getting more data, hopefully and training that. Um, yeah, I think that's it from my end, but thank you so much for listening. Sure. Yeah. Great, thank you yeah, very much. <coughs> we'll uh, look out here so we can talk about some uh, different questions here. But overall, we look at the different uh, key areas that we wanted to assess, um, which we're able to do with the unique nature of synthetic aperture sonar, high res, but then wide area as well. Um, and that enables us to use some computer vision techniques that weren't previously uh, applicable to conventional sonar um, work. Um, very high area coverage rate, as I mentioned before, a routine survey is possible um, based on this, uh, this technology, um, and hopefully this is a useful tool going forward for preventative maintenance uh, techniques, and I'll just uh, end there. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I don't have Nico's contact information up here, but if you reach out to me, I can pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Wait, we got all your extra slides in here too, so. <laughs> Hold on. All right, where'd you go? You come on up. Good afternoon and uh, uh, thanks for <coughs> yep, being here today. And uh, on behalf of our team, i um, like to talk about our like, um, you know, newly funded project to develop a service. It's the, the service is called like uh, Atlantic Seaboard Offshore Wind Stability, uh, you know, even uh, risk evaluations and service. The uh, work uh, include the teams of uh, several members here uh, from Clarkson University, uh, G Energy Consulting, and uh, New York Power Authority. Uh, so we have members there with me, uh, Professor Thomas Ortmeier, and uh, several other members uh, uh, online. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, the, the main purpose of this service is to uh, really um, facilitate the 30 gigawatt offshore wind integration by 2030, and you know, uh, the vision is 110 gigawatt by 2050. And uh, so, uh, how do we go up about that? So we envision that there's a lot of risk uh, integration, like that much uh, of offshore wind into the, uh, into the power grid. And uh, why are those challenging? Um, integrating like those offshore wind would uh, require integration of many large uh, wind turbines. Right? As you can see, um, you know, we, we have uh, realized uh, several big wind turbines from 14 to 16 gigawatt, uh, uh, sorry, me megawatt uh, on uh, different ma manufacturers. And those are the inverter-based resources. And uh, the problem with those uh, inverter-based resources, it uh, could create a system-wide control stability issues. And uh, as we observe uh, for the last decades or so, 
so many events happen in uh, all, all over the world, like from uh, in the U.S., a court, like uh, in China, in the United Kingdom, and Scotland, uh, th that we observe those control uh, instability issues. Um, that would create the other issues like intermittent resources uh, impacting the system reliability, uh, reduce short circuit current and, and negative sequence uh, that impact the system protection and, and control, grid grid uh, with no initials that impact the system controls. And uh, there's a uh, problem with the project cancellation and, and delay because of those uh, issues um, and the late identification of those um, you know, issues is good, good, good uh, be detrimental to, to, uh, to developers um, and vendors. So uh, our service here is to, um, to, to uh, fulfill the gap. Uh, as you can see on the top left corner there, that is a gap that we try to fulfill there is create a service that is a system-wide microsecond solution, resolution solutions, as uh, I think like Vahen just talked in the first uh, talk is that, um, you know, there's, there, there's some tool about the PSSC for system-wide uh, simulation, but uh, it does not capture the microsecond sol resolutions, and it does not represent the unbalanced uh, phenomenon, and uh, it only represents, for example, a positive sequence. So um, our solution would, 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 uh, would be able to capture all of those. And that would also stand on top of some of the industry uh, standard tools, like you know, uh, real-time simulation on, or, or PSCAT uh, simulation tools. The service is, uh, uh, would, would be created on top of uh, our capability here on, uh, on the left-hand side here. That is the capability that we have created through the NICERDA project uh, that we have developed for the NIGWAT offshore wind. We model NIGWAT, and we provide the model for the uh, New York power systems. And we leverage that to the uh, um, to the 30 gigawatt reali uh, realization of the of the offshore wind in the Atlantic. So we provide the model for the 30 gigawatt with multiple farms, and um, that could uh, interconnect with the New York system, with the uh, New I ISO New England systems, uh, PJM and uh, North Carolina. In terms of like a MT model for the for the uh, farm, so we provide you know the uh, model for uh, multiple farms. I think roughly around like 30 farms there uh, would uh, incorporate multiple wind turbines from 8 to 15 uh, megawatts uh, of power, and we provide the HVDC and HVDC transmission uh, option as well for uh, for those farms. Um, for the onshore system, we provide the both like re detail and reduced scale model for the. Uh, PJM, ISO New England, and North Carolina, so we can uh, provide the interconnection of those farms that we have developed to, like, to have the overall scope of, uh, of the 30 gigawatt offshore wind in, in, uh, in uh, the Atlantic um, area. From the model that we uh, have developed, then, uh, then we'd uh, provide the uh, um, risk metrics uh, that would uh, reveal the load rejections, early trippings, and other uh, outages, and we'd identify the high risk conditions uh, uh, that would occur from the extreme weather conditions. Um, and that also induce the contingen contingencies and fault events. Uh, and uh, those uh, issues is, uh, concerns us in terms of protection system failures, uh, in terms of like tripping errors, for example. Um, others uh, event that Van just mentioned in the previous talk was the subsynchronous resonance or supersynchronous resonance as, as well that we have uh, also need to, uh, to uh, um, you know, uh, review. And uh, we evaluate uh, some of the potential risk mitigation, like I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, is like uh, advanced resonant uh, frequency scanning tools um, and uh, other, you know, techniques such as the isolation of the series compensated lines. But we have to identify, okay, if that is a device that causes resonance uh, or causes instability or not. And uh, we also provide the uh, uh, solution like damping uh, technology like synchronous condensers, generators, or fact devices, adaptive tuning of wind turbines, and, um, and so on. That would benefit the developers, uh, operators, and manufacturers in multiple um, you know, uh, aspects, from the point of uh, economics to the uh, um, integration of tens of gigawatt of offshore wind, um, and uh, fasten the, uh, fasten the, 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 the uh, success of grid sanctioning technology like fact devices, condensers, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, so, so that this one uh, is a newly funded pro project, and we have not really started yet. And uh, I'd provide you an overview of what we have learned in the uh, New York State um, for the Niagara offshore wind. 
that is the uh, uh, model and uh, that we have developed under the uh, another NYSERDA uh, effort that we provide the model for eight farms, uh, including the uh, three HVAC and five HVDC farms. Uh, they, are pro uh, they, they are modeled in the real-time system simulator like OPORT that represent the non-fundamental frequencies uh, uh, components. And also the uh, New York system is, uh, has been also modeled in, in RTDS, which also like uh, real-time EMT tools. And we uh, combine those two models to the HL interface that we have developed. The wind turbine model is, uh, is the um, 8 to 12, uh, sorry, 8 to 15 megawatt. Um, those are the generic model, but uh, re that represent the boundary condition defined by the industry standard like IEEE uh, 2800 for the negative, negative sequence, for example, fast frequency response and, and uh, TOV uh, support. Here's one of the example of, of, of the farms uh, that you can see here that we have the Empire. This one is notional, it's not the real, uh, you know, uh, already built one. So um, the notional wind farm here would include 68 wind turbines with the detailed wind turbines model here that you can see um, that is back-to-back -back con converter with the permanent synchronous generators, 230 kV AC export uh, cables, and so we have substation also and, and, and offshore uh, substations. Other options for the uh, larger uh, wind farms interconnections uh, could be HVDC, and you know that can be um, for the 900 to 1.2 to 1.4 gigawatt, with uh, you know, length of transmission is more than 100 kilometers. The performance of the HVAC and HVDC uh, could be smooth, uh, and uh, it can uh, ride through the phone events uh, okay. Um, I did not show the phone event here, but we actually show that it, it, it's okay to ride through the phone events in terms of localized. Uh, models, uh, technique that is uh, a commonly practiced uh, for the industries. However, the non-common uh, practice for in industry that uh, they have not used is the details coupling between the uh, you know regional system, like de detail model of, of the um, onshore system and the detail model of the offshore systems. And we review that. There's many oscillation issues. And those are the sub synchronous re resonance issues that we have to uh, address that did not review in the localized system model. Uh, that is commonly, uh, commonly like practiced by the industries. And one of the solutions here is tuning the controllers. And uh, if you tune the controller, that works fine um, afterward. However, under a fold event here that we have conducted for overall 9 gigawatt offshore wind interconnection with 40 gigawatt of uh, you know, New York power systems. So we observe the sub uh, oscillation, that is sustained oscillations, and that has not been addressed uh, effectively yet until we actually disconnect one of the farms, which is a big issue here. All right. And we observe those in the other uh, two and 30 hertz here. A third uh, critical uh, point here is the system protections. Uh, we observe that uh, with the current like what offshore wind, we observe it's like six cycle of uh, you know, critical clearing times uh, re reductions. Um, 20 cycle is not a big deal right now, but uh, when we retire more thermal generators, then the, um, you know, the, the, the level of um, a critical clearing time would be significant, significantly reduced, and that would surely impact the protection system performance. All right. Um, in summary, so there's uh, so many problems, um, you know, that when, when we that we see that with the 9 gigawatt, and we we will surely see with the 30 gigawatt, and uh, we learn from that from the system modeling risk evaluation method and enhanced mitigation techniques that we would develop through the uh, service here. And so once the service is ready, um, I think that it provide the uh, higher level of reliability, uh, and we rely the 30 gigawatt offshore wind integrations uh, for the um, Atlantic at least and. Uh, you know, for the vision of 110 gigawatt uh, by 2050 in the U.S., and uh, that would provide the you know more input into the new standards or enhanced standard by NERC PIC, or TPL, or MOT. With that, uh, you know, I'd uh, like to take any question, or any uh, if you have any like after the talk. Thank you.
Hey, hi everyone. Um, this is Aziz Azat. I'm assistant professor of industrial and systems engineering at uh, Rutgers University. And uh, today I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about our um, uh, also newly awarded project, um, which is called IRWARF. Um, um, the project's still under contracting, so uh, we do not necessarily have uh, exciting results yet, but we uh, we hope that uh, we're going to excite you enough to hopefully come to our presentation next year to see the exciting work we're going to do. Um, so uh, basically, um, what um, what this uh, project is, um, I think most of us have seen this uh, map multiple times by uh, by this time of the conference. There's huge potential for uh, the U.S. Uh, offshore wind industry, but also there's a lot of uncertainties. Right, we're put we're putting. Um, large machines in uh, remote locations where we have sparse measurements, right? So how can we uh, somehow mitigate those uncertainties? And one of the key questions that we're going to try to answer in this product is basically how to use advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to minimize some of those uncertainties in operating and uh, integrating uh, those ultra-scale offshore wind farms into uh, our grid. Uh, so this project is basically about, mostly about forecasting, okay? Uh, so we know that one of the major challenges in, in offshore uh, wind farms, and in wind farms in general, uh, is uh, the wind resource itself, right? The wind resource itself is uncertain, uh, which uh, adds a lot of uh, operational uh, challenges. Um, so our ability to accurately forecast the wind resource and the power output um, at... Um, uh, at um, uh, fine enough resolutions is extremely important for a wide range of operations, depending on the forecast horizon and depending on the spatial level of the forecast, right? So uh, any of those boxes is basically an, opera an operation that is typically tied with an economic benefit, right? Think about operations and maintenance which could span weeks or also could span the daily uh, ahead schedule. You obviously need wind uh, field forecasts in order to we assess whether it's safe or not to dispatch your uh, your crew, right? Think about from a farm level perspective, I need the wind power forecasts as accurately as possible in order to be able to uh, optimally participate in the electricity market or uh, uh, optimally uh, um, uh, optimally uh, know how much power I'm expecting to produce. Same thing from the power system uh, level. Uh, I need to also be able to uh, accurately predict how much power I'm expecting uh, to produce in order to match that supply of electricity. Um, so um, the focus of this project will be mostly on short-term forecasting, sort of starting from a few minutes ahead all the way till one or two days ahead uh, into the future. And we can see that we can see that uh, many of the operations uh, in uh, this um, chart um, could really benefit from an accurate uh, forecast. So um, what are we doing uh, particularly different than uh, the forecasting models out there? Um, so one of the main uh, problems that we are trying to address in this project is basically to develop a forecasting solution that is particularly tailored to the offshore wind projects in the U.S. Mid and North uh, Atlantic. Um, so um, our, we have two major objectives. One is to basically develop this tool, uh, which we have called uh, IRWARF. Um, um, and IRWARF is basically a fusion of two main things, a fusion of uh, a region-specific physics-based model, so a physics-based model that has been particularly tailored to those offshore wind energy areas, as I mentioned, uh, and then adding a layer of artificial intelligence machine learning on top of that in order to first calibrate those, those physics-based models uh, and also obtain uh, predictions uh, that uh, outperform those that would have been obtained solidly using the physics-based model or solidly using a, 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 a purely machine learning based approach. Um, and um, the second objective is to extensively evaluate our wharf on two main fronts. One is uh, forecast quality, so basically how accurate are our forecasts. Um, and the second uh, front, which is equally important, is forecast value, right? Um, so um, uh, accuracy and value, obviously, uh, they come hand in hand, but their relationship is not necessarily linear, right? Uh, so we need to assess um, how much economic value can we achieve by using those forecasts into uh, uh, some of the uh, wind farm level and grid level uh, operations? 
Um, so, as I mentioned, our primary focus will be on the offshore wind energy areas in the U.S. Mid and North Atlantic. We're going to focus on uh, wind field forecasts and wind power forecasts. Our focus is on short term, starting from a few minutes up to a day uh, ahead in the future. Uh, and we're going to focus on multiple spatial resolu resolutions, mainly at the turbine farm and, and regional levels. Um, uh, many end users could potentially benefit from this tool, starting from the developers and operators who obviously use uh, those forecasting tools uh, for their uh, day-to-day -day operations, utilities and grid operators are the same, um, uh, but we believe that there are many other end users other than uh, the offshore wind farm operators and developers that could possibly uh, benefit from this tool. Um, basically an example that I gave earlier uh, is, for instance, uh, the o and contractor who need to assess basically the sea state, for instance, in order to whether the, the vessel could, could go and, and, and maintain a wind turbine or, 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 or not. So many users for, uh, for this tool, and uh, we hope that many end users will emerge as we progress through this project. So who are we? Um, this project basically involves um, uh, three, three main institutions uh, working together on different pieces. Uh, we have uh, Rutgers uh, University, where I'm, I'm affiliated with, and from Rutgers University we have two um, main uh, departments. Uh, one is the Department of Industrial Systems Engineering, which I belong to. Um, I basically lead a research group there called the Renew Renewables and Industrial Analytics Research Lab, uh, where we basically address technical challenges related to offshore wind from a machine learning and data science perspective. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, co-PIs also from the Rutgers Center for Ocean Observing Leadership, particularly from the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences, um, who bring in their expertise in meteorological modeling, atmospheric modeling, and oceanography, um, and obviously offshore wind as well. Um, we are partnering with uh, Clarkson University, and um, uh, and you've just seen from uh, Tony's presentation uh, the um, the expertise that they are bringing in in terms of uh, the power systems modeling, um, um, production cost simulation, um, uh, different power systems uh, analytics. Uh, from there, we have um, uh, Professor Tom Ortmeyer from Clarkson who's attending the presentation. Uh, we have also Leo Jiang from uh, uh, from Clarkson University, uh, and then the third third institution is uh, EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, uh, and we have Noah Myrant and Curtis Fox, both of them are here, and they are bringing um, also a lot of expertise related to offshore wind, um, um, wind farm data analysis and power systems uh, modeling, and of course, um, uh, long-standing relationships with many of the stakeholders that we are uh, targeting. Um, we have been fortunate also to assemble a, a diverse and a strong industrial advisory board, so, so far we have six plus stakeholders representing utilities, operators, uh, wind farm uh, operators, as I mentioned. Um, uh, so we're, we're, um, uh, we're excited about having them to provide us with um, expertise um, and feedback to, to the models that we're developing and, and potentially and hopefully data so resources too so that we can better train our models. Um, so a little bit of uh, about the background technology, and uh, um, I'm going to present a little bit about what we have been uh, what we have been doing um, uh, so far. Um, so if I take a little bit longer than that, don't worry, I don't have results. So I'm going to save you a little bit of time on that. Um, so so uh, a central piece of our model, um, as you recall, our model is called Airwarf. A central piece, or the predecessor of it, is RU Wharf, which stands for the Rutgers University Wharf uh, model. And this model has been developed in the last uh, decade um, by the Rutgers University Center for Ocean Observing Leadership with support from uh, New Jersey BPU. Uh, it's basically a variant of Wharf that is particularly tailored to the US Mid and North Atlantic. Uh, so that's the main unique uh, uh, strength of it, is that it captures the physical phenomena uh, that happens uh, in this uh, region. And it has been shown over the years to outperform other models uh, that are n neutral to the region in a sense, that do not necessarily are, are particularly set up for, for that region. Um, and it, it has been recently validated in 2020 by, in, through an independent study by, uh, by Enril, and throughout the years it has been continuously upgraded and continuously uh, improved. So that's one of the uh, central pieces and central components of uh, what we're doing. Uh, 
Um, the, the, the new piece that we're adding on top of RE Wharf is basically whether we can combine this with the, all of the advancements in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this is something that we have started in the last two years and hopefully we're gonna continue forward with uh, support from now RDC, uh, which is uh, basically taking the outputs from RE Wharf, combining it with the sparse measurements that we have from the different buoys, uh, different LiDAR buoys that we have access uh, so far, and then uh, developing, um, uh, developing models that can further uh, calibrate RU Wharf uh, at uh, resolutions that uh, are not necessarily practically feasible by numerical weather prediction models. Uh, and we have been, uh, we have or already shown some uh, promising results uh, achieved uh, using the, uh, the data that NYSERDA has published in the last uh, three years through the EO5 and EO6 buoys. So these actually are probabilistic predictions that we have obtained from our initial version of IR Wharf. Um, uh, which have been uh, shown to be uh, fairly successful. Um, so there's, there's a lot of promise, but there's also a large potential for, for improvements in terms of the how, much, how far ahead can we forecast, how also short ahead can we forecast, because these are two different uh, problems, right? At short-term forecasting, uh, at ultra short term forecasting, we're trying to forecast things for like few minutes ahead or possibly sub hourly interval. Um, uh, typically, the physics based models start to lose their power, but machine learning models tend to, ca to catch up. At the longer term horizon, the opposite happens. So you'll find that uh, machine learning models actually start losing their power, where physics based models give you a much better prediction. So being able to strengthen those and uh, borrow strength across both the physics based learning and the uh, machine learning paradigms is one of the things that we hope to achieve uh, during this project. Um, um, uh, the, the third piece of background technology is coming from, from Clarkson University, uh, which as I mentioned brings uh, decades of expertise in, um, in power systems modeling, uh, and they have um, already been uh, working on developing models uh, uh, particularly tailored for the New York State. Uh, so one of the things that we hope to achieve, as I mentioned in this project, is to integrate those forecasts into some of those power grid models and start assessing exactly what are the economic benefits that we can achieve if such a uh, tool got deployed and got uh, uh, commercialized. Um, so the expected end goals of the project, um, one of the things that we uh, focus on is getting probabilistic forecast as there are more and more uh, uh, industrial ad adoptions for not only the expected value of your predictions, but also how much you are confident about your forecast. So this is one of the things that we want to focus on. Uh, we're targeting both wind field and power forecasts, multiple forecast horizons, multiple spatial resolutions. One of the things that we're very interested in is basically um, uh, developing these uh, forecast maps uh, and uh, launching them uh, uh, to, to, for public dissemination uh, for effective communication and visualization of, the, of, of our forecast. So this is going to be a key, um, a key part of our outcomes and deliverables. Um, um, as more measurements and more data is coming online, uh, we are hoping to further extensively uh, test uh, those uh, predictions on the key in proximity to key areas in the offshore wind energy regions. Um, and we hope to also have a rigorous, uh, to basically put a dollar tag on Iron Wharf, not only um, not only how much we can improve in terms of mean absolute error, but also how much dollars we can save if such a uh, forecast tool got adopted. Um, so our project timeline, we're uh, hoping to start soon. I've put in uh, uh, January here, but uh, Corey can confirm if January is doable or not. Um, um, so, so if we start in January, uh, we're gonna. Our project is about um, one year and a half, or a little bit more than one year and a half. Um, so, um, we have uh, two main tasks uh, lined up. Uh, they are gonna be working in parallel: one on the weather and wind field, wind field forecasting, one on power grid modeling, uh, and then trans transiting to uh, task two is going to be more on the power uh, analytics uh, and the grid integration piece, uh, and also. Um, related to the launch of this uh, tool. So we're planning on hosting um, basically a web interface for, for Iron Wharf that's gonna communicate the outputs or at least samples of the outputs from those forecasts uh, to benefit the uh, offshore wind industry uh, as a whole. Um, so with that, I uh, conclude my presentation. I thank you very much for your attendance and I give it to Gary. Uh, before you sit down, I'm going to ask you a question while those guys come up and tell all of you that we're using the Slido app, which you might have used before, so if you could throw your questions in there. What am I looking at? What? 
Oh, yeah. Here? <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm, I'm experienced okay. by now. <laughs> uh, but since we, we have about 15 minutes, I'm going to ask you a quick question just to get us started. Do you think your tool, is it more for um, scheduling and forecasting, or will people, meaning developers and power market people, use it actually for revenue purposes as well? Like, and it, it, it's also the customer, the ISO, or is it more on the developer side? Um, so um, so the, the, we, we hope that it's going to be both, in a, in, in a sense. So our main focus is forecasting. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the grid integration piece is, is, is extremely important to, as I mentioned, put the dollar tag on, on mm -hmm. our wharf. Uh, so we, um, we um, but what, having said that, one of the things that we hope to achieve through our uh, continuous interaction with our industry advisory board is to be able to tailor our forecasting model to the needs of the end users. Uh, so we're flexible on that regard as well. So if, you find, if we find more interest from wind farm developers, we're going to tailor our tool to, uh, uh, to, to, to address the needs of the wind farm developers and vice versa. Okay, and, okay great. Thank you. So um, I, I guess you have to, I don't know, this is really yeah. awkward, sorry. <laughs> Put your questions in the tool, right? Have I got it right? Okay, I'm waiting for them to, to come up. Um, but maybe while we wait a minute, I wrote down a, a few things. Um, that I, I thought I'd ask, and I think I think our theme today is is you know predictive tools and simulation tools, and also um, damage assessment, right? Like all, all, all three, you know, all all four of the things that we have here today are, are tools to either predict or assess kind of a current circumstance. And I want to talk to uh, maybe you guys can all reflect a little bit on um, how. Um, how you think, if you can talk a little about who you think your customers are a little bit, like is it is it more on the grid side or is it really developers or is it every, you know, is it the public generally? And, and you answered that a little bit uh, just a minute ago, but maybe that's just kind of a very broad question to kick us off before we get into technology specific things. Because part of, I know what the consortium is trying to do and what developers and our other partners are trying to do is to take these things and actually, you know, I don't want to say commercialize them, but make sure they're put in use, right? Um, so maybe you can just talk, add a couple comments on that, each one of you. Okay. Oh, was I not on? Oh. Thank goodness I talked really loud. Thanks. Okay, this is on. They heard me, so. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, start yeah thanks. So uh, the, the tool that I presented, we've been developing, I mean, it, it has uh, more uh, specific or specialized set of users. We envision that. Uh, project developers and uh, operators will be uh, kind of a number one um, set of users. Uh, and then, of course, ISOs uh, and, 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 and utilities where the, uh, the social projects will be interconnected to are also uh, users for that. Um, the other set of users can also be academia. So it can be used by academia, but for sure is not for general public or, 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 or more general people, you know, like, I don't know, legis regulators or legislators are not qualified to use it. With all due respect, this is, you know, the yeah. core power systems engineering, but they definitely will benefit from uh, results of that work. Steve, yeah, okay. yeah, it's on already. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah, for us, it's more cut dry. Cut and dry in terms of operations and maintenance, the folks that are responsible for maintaining the integrity of the wind farm here. So, from our perspective, the, the routine survey work um, and whoever mandates that or who that falls onto. Um, but during that life cycle, in terms of the balance of plant, um, this would be critical for uh, preventative maintenance purposes. Um, yeah, I think I second to Van. It's like um, the I mean, uh, Piascat and PSSC have, have been used by industries a lot. and. Uh, I mean, for our tool is uh, the current practice, as I mentioned, is uh, many of the localized study, and we provide a system wide. So um, that will be used by uh, project developers, um, you know, operators, to evaluate uh, to evaluate the risk, and uh, also the OEM, making sure that the the technology could be uh, proven and demonstrated before uh, you know, commercial commercializations. Yeah. Great. So we, we did have questions, sorry. I was looking at the floating wind section. I was like, those aren't applicable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
uh, this is sort of a broad question, but I, I, well, it is a broad question, but I think, uh, you know, um, each, each project actually <coughs> could be impacted by it, um, although in different ways, particularly Steve versus, you know, the other three. Um, many of you probably heard that um, the state of New York uh, in its RFP has uh, requested that bidders um, include the prospect of a potential mesh grid, um, meaning they have to kind of, the bid has, not the only bid, but they have to offer that option that they are interconnecting into whatever a mesh grid is. Right. Uh, and there is a proposal out, in New, or an RFI out in New England, a five-state RFI which contemplates any number of different transmission scenarios which could include some sort of offshore system. Another proposal I heard about today would talk about an offshore grid system connecting the Gulf of Maine uh, and Nova Scotia. So I just put those out as, and the same thing's being talked about for California. Um, I put those out there because there is a trend right now, at least in policy circles and to some extent in these solicitations, to look uh, not so much at just a Gentile approach, but mesh grids or whatever you want to call offshore grid systems. And I'm wondering, uh, and while this might be jumping ahead for a little bit of the work you all are working on, um, how that might, can you take that into consideration in, the work you're, consideration in the work you're doing today? Or is that something else that would need to be looked at in a different kind of simulation? And I think it's true for grid inter integration. I think it's true for market analysis. I also think there are aspects to it that are uh, about um, assessing the, physic the physicality or the, the, the state of the physicalness of a, a cable connector um, if you have an offshore grid system. So a little out there, but if, if anyone has a comment on that, I appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a first comment uh, regarding that. I, I think I've heard of the uh, NYSERDA recent call for um, the mesh HPC, like mesh ready. Um, and I think there are many options uh, for the mesh ready. Is that like, you know, uh, AC connection, DC connections? Um, and what would be the control? Like, is that grid forming or grid following? I mean, that's still up in the air, and I think that is still an open research area to because it surely increases the reliability, but we don't know the stability, um, you know, for sure. Uh, that's why, like, I think in, in our project, we also propose to to investigate the mesh uh, HPDC as well, um, you know, as a part of the uh, model of uh, output. Yeah, that, that, that's just my uh, two cents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, it, it makes a huge difference in pretty much at any scale, from project economics uh, down to how you design it, how you operate it, how you protect it, and how it impacts the grid, whether is it uh, traditional radial point-to-point, -point, interconnected offshore wind, or, or a multi-terminal uh, mesh network. So I personally see it as, as an enormous challenge uh, to design something today on point-to-point -point basis having a mesh system of the future in mind, because we simply don't know enough what, what to expect. Any thoughts on that? Um, Steve, this might be more targeted to you, although it sort of reflects on that a little bit. Um, what are the potential challenges in sonar-based monitoring for inter-ray cables, uh, particularly for floating? I don't, I don't know if that's something you all think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I touched on it in this case a little bit for these, uh, for the outer continental shelf, for example. Um, tote system is economical, right? You can have a couple hundred meters of cable on the system and you get real-time feedback. So that's great. So I can look and say, okay, hey, there's a thermal client or I can identify something immediately, a problem that can dynamically be task the asset, right? Hey, get off your main scheme line, just come check this out at a different angle, for example, get a different view of the, of the target or anomaly, however you want to describe it. Um, when you talk about floating wind, um, it's probably less critical for some of the uh, um, the methods to secure the turbines, and as well as the depth of um, of operations is increasingly challenging. Right, you're probably not doing that with a a towed system necessarily in a cost effective manner. So then you start looking at different AUVs, for example, um, which can be cost effective long term, but right now they're expensive assets and they're not used. Um, as often as, say, more conventional survey technology. So you do run the risk of not being able to evaluate the data right away, for example, 
Um, so you could have additional time on site, time on target, so you're, you're wasting expenses in, in that regard. Um, and then just as you get deeper, um, it's just a more difficult and challenging operational um, era, area. So from a sonar perspective, if you're still using surface mounted systems, you're going to lose a tremendous amount of fidelity in the data just based on the sheer distance. And if you shift to things and get closer to the infrastructure itself, they become more difficult and expensive to operate. So there'll certainly be a trade-off, but you'll probably see these systems that may be more expensive in the beginning and over time will result in the positive economics for the project as a whole. Another question we had, um, which is actually something I think about a lot when it comes to um, uh, points of interconnection, is if any, if any, this might be less for you, Stephen, than for the other three folks. Um, how are any of you taking into context uh, facility retirements? We know over the course of the next you know, five or 15 years, up and down the East Coast, we have retirement of some facilities. Um, how is that going to impact spinning reserve and other things? And is that impacting your models and taking those into consideration? Um, it's, I think it's true for forecasting the market as well as for, you know, the, the grid interconnect. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that is a great question. It's, uh, the, the part of the uh, retirement of the like thermal generator is already a big piece because uh, like when you retire them, you need something to be in place, right, to make sure that uh, you have enough resource. It's not just that, you also need to make sure that the system is stable. Uh, and it's not an easy task. And um, we, uh, we have considered that in our uh, previously funded project, but uh, the implementation is still um, ongoing now. And I think like, um, for the uh, next pro project, yeah, we surely need to uh, consider those. But the uh, you know, scenario is still up in the air, uh, which is based on the best knowledge and the advice uh, from the advisory board, and what could be taken out and um, you know, retrofit uh, yeah. is what, uh, what I think. You know, one thought there that the synchronous generation is not going to disappear overnight, right? So it's going to be a gradual process. Uh, so in a very well-planned approach and, and utilizing uh, the capabilities that exist in the variable generation itself to provide uh, all types of reliability services to the grid, whether it's offshore wind, onshore wind, PV, PV plants, or uh, utility scale energy storage, they all can provide uh, same type of services that conventional generation is provided. Just a matter of uh, creating incentives for them to do so. And to me, it, well, there are some technical aspects to it, but it's more like a market issue, right? You have to have markets for reliability service in place uh, to incentivize curtailment by offshore wind, for example, to be able to provide both spinning reserve, uh, frequency regulation, other type of active power controls, and also the voltage control. So, those are all on existence, just needs to be used in the right way. Can I comment that hopefully we'll have some more boxes in your forecasting model, right? As oh. we, you know, it's yeah, as a go to yeah. um, particularly comment uh, on that. Um, so um, we hope that the, this grid integration piece that we have in this product, so that there was, um, as I mentioned, there was a main reason to, uh, to, to put that into place because we, we really want to assess um, the economic benefits of the forecast through that power grid models, um, and um, and uh, I, I do believe based on my communication with the uh, with my co-PIs and clubs and that um, these power grid models are represent basically the future scenarios of how the power grid would look like. So that's what we're gonna focus on, um, and I do, I do believe that they're they're gonna model it with different granularities to take into account those different uh, details. Great. And I'll leave the last question for you, actually, on that. Oh, that's okay. Um, there were many more questions. Well, this, can the presenters see those later, or do they disappear? Just curious. Okay, so there are some other comments and things like that, just so you're all aware if you want to take a look, uh, for each one of you, actually. But um, the, I'll give you the last, the, uh, last answer on that, or the last question. Um, any thoughts on advancing the forecast models to dispatch uh, hybrid HD systems with DC wind integration? Is anyone looking at those operating systems? Okay, so that, that, that's a good question. Um, um, I do believe that, again, my copy eyes from the Power Systems Group would be best suited to, uh, to address that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. yeah, no worries. They can do it online. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and uh, to you, gentlemen, for presenting uh, your projects, which are fascinating and uh, um, I think really helpful to think about in terms of how we move forward in connecting our grid and forecasting and 
making sure we stay on top of um, you know, the physicality of things too, like are we actually, <laughs> can our cables actually stay interconnected and, and when do we have challenges? And Steve, I had a lot of questions for you on that as it relates to the West Coast, but those for another day, I think. So. That's good. Okay, join me in thank, thanking our panelists. Please. Thank you.